This is this is this is. Zach yeah. Lynn, dude, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Uh, big fan. Love Jimmy Eat World. So uh, excited to have you on. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that, dude. Thanks yeah. for having me on. Yeah, yeah. So what have you guys been up to? I noticed you uh, you put out a new song recently. Um, yeah. Something Loud. Sounds classic. Yeah. Sounds great. It sounds almost timeless to me. Like, I didn't read anything about it. I just threw it on when I, you know, knew you were going to be on. And, uh, yeah, I mean... You know, just a little background on me. I first knew about you guys back on your first album, Static Prevails. Uh, Tom Wisniewski, our guitar player, had this giant CD book. He always had the giant CD book. So we were just like, all right, he's got the music. And I remember flipping <laughs> through it and finding that album. And and I think the reason is because the cover is like, it's like got like bar stools with snow on it. Uh -huh. And that always yeah. just kind of stuck out to me. So... So uh, all these years, you guys, I didn't, I didn't even realize at the time that you guys had started maybe like even a year after us. We started in 92. Um, That's and, right. And, and so, but to me, you guys were already, you know, on your way, massive. You had an album that, that sounded great. So <laughs> congratulations on that. <laughs> um, Thanks, man. All these years later, uh, still going, man. What keeps it interesting for you? Um, I think we just enjoy being in a band together. We have fun. Um, we all get along really well. Um, you know, I think that we're just lucky. I think in just the chemistry that we have is, is pretty low drama. And, uh, you know, I think it just, our, I feel like our bond and our kind of relationship and our understanding of each other just gets better over time. So I think that makes it, um, that makes it kind of work really well. Um, and I think just that challenge of, I think we're really driven by the challenge of making new music. And that's something that we've always never wanted. We never want to, to take like our foot off that gas pedal and figure out a way to keep making music that, you know, like probably like halfway through our career up until this point, I think we realized we really need to take seriously what we release because it's got to earn it. Like we're now competing with our own catalog. Right. So if, if we want to, if we want to put something new out, it needs to earn its place in some way. And, and if it doesn't, then if we don't think it does, then we shouldn't bother releasing it. And so I think just that challenge has kind of kept things fresh for us. And um, yeah, we just kind of just, have enjoyed that process um all the way up until today wow that's that's pretty amazing because it's hard to it's hard to not to wander a little bit and not that you haven't necessarily in life over the years but to keep focused on making music i love the attitude of 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 just trying to continue to compete with yourself and that's huge i mean uh love the new stuff love the the recent album surviving um it's all really, really well done. It sounds good. It really just sounds really good. And that's what I always noticed about you guys back in the day is just, you know, we were kind of from, well, MXPX, my band, were from the punk scene, you know, and everything was fast, fast, fast. And when you guys kind of slowed things down, you could really hear what you were doing. And I really loved that. That's probably why people really dug it. Cause they're like, I can hear what they're saying. I can hear these notes. <laughs> so yeah. it really worked and, and well. Yeah, and having that contrast, I mean, I think we, we when we started out, we were kind of like more in the punk vein and um, really, I mean, to this day, still love all the old like kind of pop punk stuff that that inspired us back then. Um, but I think we always kind of had a pull to like trying things out, like slowing things down and um, over the course of time learning like, you know, how to record songs like that, how to think about songs that are like a little bit slower. Um, and I think that's, you know, the, the contrast there has been a challenge that we've always kind of embraced and, and want to learn how to do that even better now. Yeah. Did you grow up in the punk scene listening to punk before you got into playing drums or how'd that happen? Yeah. Like I wasn't as much of like a punk kid. I was more of like an REM you two uh nice i love that too you know <laughs> yeah i love i that 
like the cure, like all of those, all of those bands kind of got me thinking about music in a way that was really inspiring. But, but, you know, when we started like in, as I got a little bit older in high school and when the band started, I mean, we loved like bands like Propagandi and no effects and um, green day and Fugazi and rocket from the crypt. Like all of those bands were hugely influential on us. Um, and still like to this day, like we, Jim will play propagandi riffs and I'll try to play drums to them. And it's really funny, but <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I mean, I think, love it. Uh, I, I, I wasn't as much of like a punk kid. I really liked punk rock and I, um, you know, I, I definitely enjoyed it and listened to it all the time. Uh, I, but I also kind of like enjoyed stuff that wasn't punk. For some reason, Toad the Wet Sprocket popped into my head. Did you ever get into them? Toad the Wet Sprocket? You ever remember? I them? never, like, I remember their, I remember, like, their hits. I thought their hits were, like, when, at the time when they came out, like, and to the same, they are good songs, you know, but, um, like, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I met the drummer from Toad the Wet Sprocket one time. That was kind of cool, but, um, he's got, like, half, yeah, a leg, the, uh, half a leg or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what I was, He's a pretty inspiring guy. I always thought that was interesting, like how he figured out how to play the drums. And it sounds amazing. I mean, I've seen them live yeah. as well. And I don't know why. I just thought, I mean, you know, maybe they're just like a total a band that a punk rocker would not be into usually. <laughs> but, but me and uh, our, my drummer, uh, Yuri, he, uh, he's so into Toad the Wet Spark. But he's into all the bands that you mentioned. Uh, Morris, you know, I don't know if you mentioned Morrissey, actually, but... Um, you know, all those bands, REM, like I, yeah, me and that means, yeah, yeah, I, I love all that stuff too. Um, yeah, there's just something about, you know, once you start playing music, it doesn't really matter what it is, if it's a good song and if people, if you're meshing with the people you're playing with, you just, you know, you enjoy it, you love it. So that's my experience anyway. For sure. I mean, like good melodies are universal, you know, when you actually strip away like a lot of no effect songs. I mean, they have these amazing harmonies and uh, chord progressions and melodies that are just, you could set those in any type of song and it would still have its like, people would be like, wow, that's really, you know, beautiful music in a way. And, you know, I think that's something we always really liked. We, we, we love, we've always been kind of rooted in like, I mean, people ask us what kind of band we are, and I think Jim always will say, we're a guitar-based melodic rock band. Like, that's our, that's how we define ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's kind of, I think, melody has been a big driver for us. And I think you, when you look at whether it's the fastest Propagandi song or the slowest R.E.M. ballad, like, it, you know, that's a common thing for that that drives those songs and and. It's why people love them. So I think for us, it's always been kind of um, the the core. Yeah. Where do you think the future is going? I mean, for for rock music in general, um, is it just kind of continuing on? Is it gonna is it, is there gonna be a new like a Nirvana moment? Does it need a Nirvana moment to to like shake people out of it? I don't know. I mean, I'd love to hear. I'm your not thoughts. sure. You know. I mean, I think there's so many great young bands like playing awesome rock and rock music, you know, when I think of bands like White Reaper or yeah. um, Pup, you know, these are like amazing bands that, you know, are doing something that like like kind of sound old, but they, they're doing it in a new way. And um, I don't know, man, like I don't. I'm not too worried about like the status of where rock is or because I, I don't think it's going, I certainly don't think it's like going away, but um, it just may not be like the thing that, that drives the conversation, but maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe there could be some sort of moment that comes along where someone's doing something that recaptures that energy in a way that, you know, is sort of undeniable to, um, kids now you know that would be cool but um you know i would certainly be all for it but um you know it's kind of the same way like for me with baseball people keep 
like talking about how do we save baseball? It's a dying sport. I was like, right. but that's why it's awesome. Like the reason why everyone hates it is the, what makes it cool. And so that, like, that, I like the fact that it's slow, you know, like, yeah. we don't need to go, we don't need to go around thinking we need to rescue all these things. It's like, um, and so I feel like rock music and, and, you know, there's something just so satisfying about the distorted guitar and banging drums that I don't think that's just going away anytime soon. Agreed. Agreed. I hope not anyway. Jeez. You know, you mentioned baseball. I'd love to talk baseball. I don't know a ton uh, about baseball, but I definitely played and I've been paying a little bit of attention. But uh, so you're obviously in the camp where like you would rather not change some of those um, rules like to make the game not go into like over innings forever. Like what are some of those some of the rules they change where they put a, a second a, a runner on second automatically if it goes into extra innings during yeah. the that's during the regular season or is that also during I think the they playoffs. do it during the regular season. I think in the playoffs, it's just normal rules, but I could be wrong. But yeah, I mean, like, I'm not, like, I don't, listen, I, 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 I don't, you know, I think one of the changes that they're doing is they're doing like a, in the minor leagues, and I think they're starting to do in the major leagues where they have like, almost like a pitch clock where you got to pitch the ball within a certain time period. They're limiting mound visits and stuff like that. And, and I'm not opposed to any of that. I just don't. Like to me, what I love about baseball is I love going to a game and I like the fact that it takes three hours. You know, I like the fact that it's like, you know, it's it's a game with roughly pretty much the same rules that have been in place forever. And so, you know, to me, it's not super fun on TV for people, but, I, I you know, um, and that's I can understand why people are considering that. But um, it's going to be, cons- you know, I. I yeah. I was going to say it's going to be considered I, I, cricket eventually, right? Cricket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cricket. I mean, cricket is the Not, same way. It's even almost more extreme because cricket matches can take like three days right, sometimes, yeah. you know? So, um, you know, I, I, it, it just, uh, you know, there's plenty of things in our life, like when we look around, that can be fast paced. And, you know, like that's just kind of the direction of life is everything is faster and like, you know, attention spans are dwindling, but you know, it's kind of like there is a certain element of like, when you're putting out an album, you're sort of really challenging people's ability to sit down for an hour and like focus on something. Um, but I don't, just because that's a, a little bit of a, a, a fight or it's a challenge doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it, you know? And, you know, I think, um, in the same way, I, I, I think that there are, some things built into life that purposefully slow us down for a good reason. And we shouldn't try to always fight those things, I guess, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, that, those are good points. I mean, the attention span wars is very real. And how did you, did you, have you always been even keel like this throughout your years of touring or is it more just like maybe over the pandemic, you know, a lot of people say that, or not a lot of people say scientists say whatever, uh, that se- your cells regenerate in your body every every five years or so. Somehow, right. I don't know, they transfer the memories so you don't forget things, but I forget plenty. Um, my point is, is the pandemics seem to have changed everybody even more, like drastically. And even if you weren't really affected by it, like you worked and you did your thing, I think there's just little things that are hard to to notice. And one of those things is is for sure attention spans. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's just we're we're all kind of adapting and living to uh, whatever our you know sort of whatever the norm is in in our society, um, you know. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think to some degree, there's it's it's good to just be conscious of it. You know, as long as we have like the knowledge of you know I'm I have my my one of my my 12 year old son has a phone and he's on it way too much and it probably does affect his time like his his attention span um so we try to like you know govern it a little bit and limit it but it's also kind of part of the reality of of the times we're in and mm-hmm. you know all you can do is like people probably said the same thing about our generation when cable news you know cable tv came out and it's like so many channels and like for sure people aren't going to be motivated to go do anything right and yeah. so there's always that thing that you kind of have to navigate and adjust to and just at least be aware of like, okay, so this is affecting us in this way. We can at least be aware of it and try to yeah um, do the best we can. That's very smart. Be aware sort of like 
I'm kind of torn between what you're saying, you know, slow down, chill, stay off it. And then also maybe, maybe I should pay attention to what's going on here and, and sort of this like push and pull of, of no, 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 chill out. <laughs> and then no, 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 get some work done. Do this, do this, check, you know, check this out. Uh, pay attention, you know, whatever it is. And, and it's like, in one way I feel like, okay, don't be the old guy, you know, that's resistant to change. But also I tell myself, don't be spastic. Don't be, you know, focus on something and chill out about it. So, I mean, it's, 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 hard. it's gotta be hard, you know, just having that knowledge helps me like you're saying, but I mean, it's taken how long to figure that out in, in my life, you know, way too long, you know, and we're yeah. all sort of like, we're in a way it feels like we're islands in a lot of the things that we didn't know yesterday and found out, you know, we watched some video like, Oh, I just found out today that, you know, the cats eat, eat their children, you know, whatever, I don't know, (laughs) whatever it is, you know, but, uh, stuff like that, like it's a push and pull always. So, yeah, for sure. And I think now more than ever, we're in like one of the things that just information age and cell phone is like, we're inundated with, you know, news stories and things that are happening all over the planet that, like 50 years ago, we wouldn't be hearing about these things, right? We'd be kind of more like, so the the level of care and concern that we have is expanding all over the globe because we're seeing th- terrible things that are happening in faraway places. Yeah. And, you know, and we're also seeing like, you know, the really good things that are happening, you know, like it's, it's we're seeing all of it, but it's, it is a sort of, I think it's just a matter of, um, being aware of like how all of this information flooding our, our senses is affecting us and trying to just manage it the best we can. It's like, and everyone deals with it differently, you know, um, you know, but, but, um, yeah, like you said, I think it's a good, good thing to kind of like you, on the one hand, we could sort of fight it and be like, you know, the old, the old man, get off my lawn. But, um, there's a certain, you know, th- that's not really realistic. Right. So, right. you know, to be, to be at least, at least open to saying, Hey, well, like, the, oh yeah, there's a trade off. So something comes along like the iPhone and we have the information of the world in our pocket at all times. There's like some good things to that. And then there's some bad things to that, you know, it's like, well, let's just recognizing what those are, recognizing how these can affect us negatively. Um, you know, it's something we're all wrestling with. Like I, I, I'm on my phone way too much, you know, and so I try to be better about that. And um, that's kind of why I do like to go to like if like if I go to a baseball game, I really like I make a rule like I try to really keep my phone in my pocket as much as possible. Yeah, and like just watch the game. Or if my my kids have my kids play baseball, so I go to their games and I try to like you know just kind of be present in the moment and like take a little break away from the phone or whatever. And um, but. You know, I'm 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 still kind of still sort of a work in progress. It's going to become a trend in the future to like act like the 20th century, or or I guess it would be 21st century, but you know, like act like it was back in the day before the internet. But uh, I was just thinking about touring before the internet, and not just touring, just life before the internet was just so different. You know, before we had phones constantly contacting, we were just you know whether we're, you know, starting out in vans and then you're in buses, but you're, you're just isolated in this box wherever you go, you get on a plane. It's like kind of before the internet was on planes, you would get on a plane and you yeah. turn your phone off and you'd have like silence for, you know, three hours or however long the flight was. That just doesn't exist anymore. There's like literally nowhere to get away from being connected. And so, yeah people that have grown up, you know, young kids that have grown up with the internet their whole lives, of course, that probably doesn't seem weird. And it doesn't seem weird, I guess. It's, it's we're perfectly adapted to it. But mm-hmm. to think about, wow, how is that changing my life? And, and a lot of, you know, mostly for the better, I, I would say, but, but it is just like con- the constant load. And I don't know if you, yeah. uh, I have a, a, a cell phone, like everybody does. And they're always constantly saying like, whether or not you should plug in your phone all night long or whether you should intermittently charge it, you know, for the battery life and all that. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I, I could understand why phones wouldn't want to be constantly plugged in 
just constant power charging all yeah. the time. And it's like, that's what the internet and what all the information is kind of to humans is just a constant charge. We just need to unplug now and again and just yeah. chill. This became like a self-help podcast, but, <laughs> well, yeah. but we're all going but through the, it. You know, that I hear you. But, you know, the irony of all of this is they were saying this shit about the printed press. Like they were saying, oh, the print like, you know, now you can uh, like have all these words and libraries. And it's it's like it's always been this struggle of like, you know, as as human as humans have marched on through time, like we figured out a way to communicate with each other more efficiently. Yeah. And we figured out a way to gain knowledge more efficiently. And it's now just like it's continuing. And and it, we've always had this struggle. And there's like you know, I think a good way to look at it is, is just that it, it it's going to bring some, some cool benefits and it's going to bring some, some unintended consequences. Um, you know, a, a friend of mine who used to be a pastor wrote a book called flickering pixels and he was a big Marshall McLuhan. His name is Shane hips, but he's a big Marshall McLuhan. Like he was really interested in Marshall McLuhan. Um, and basically uh, unpacked about like, like how t churches use technology and how like when a pastor puts his face up on a big screen, it grants him like this unearned authority that, yeah. um, so on the one hand, if you want to be a, a, like a celebrity pastor, your goal should be to put your face up on the screen so you can seem bigger and more important. And it, it just, even the size and the screens themselves give everyone in the room this impression that, oh, this person is like really important. You know, um, and he said, you know, that's a choice you can make. Or if you want to be a pastor that doesn't want that, then you can choose not to do that. And it, it's just about knowing, like, the, the, knowing the effects of the choices that you make. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's really interesting that, like, um, just yesterday we did a, a press event downtown for a show we're doing in October in Phoenix. And we're playing with the, the, the band The Main who's all also from here. And, um, you know, they're an awesome band. That's kind of like, they're younger than we are. Um, but they, uh, we were kind of talking about the differences in how things were when we started, as opposed to when they started, when we started probably the same with you guys. No, no, we had a, like when we went on tour, we, no one had cell phones. Right. Um, the first time we had anything that someone could contact us with is Tom had a pager. And so, Everyone in my family and everyone in everyone's family knew Tom's pager number in case they needed to get a hold of us. And that was like the extent of it. Like, yeah, that's how they got a hold of us. Um, and talking about their experience of like how they marketed themselves on MySpace. And I was like, yeah, MySpace didn't exist when we were there. And, you know, on the one hand, we could be saying like the curmudgeonly old band, like, oh, we didn't have all the benefits mm -hmm. of MySpace or cell phones on tour. We didn't do we didn't have any of that. But um, but the reality of it is, is that it didn't really make things any easier for them, I don't think, because in the end, you know, with the advent of MySpace and with the advent of, of bands being able to do more things on their own, there's so many more bands now. Like when we started, like, I don't know what it was like when you were like in high school, but like there wasn't like a ton of kids starting bands. Like, no, there wasn't. Like no. if you were a, if you were like a good band at your high school, like you were it, like there, there wasn't really any competition, maybe even in the whole town. I'm right? convinced that's the only and reason so, why we got a record deal, <laughs> <laughs> but there's no one else. <laughs> but now, but now it's like starting a band, the, 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 the amount of, of time and yeah. effort to do it has been made so much easier. And there's like, like, like with anything else, there's some really cool aspects to that. Like, I think it's rad that a kid can like, just go on YouTube, learn how to record, make recordings in his bedroom that sound amazing and just put them out. Like, I think yeah. that's so cool. But then there's also like this flooding of the market of everyone has a song or a single or an album or a new band. And it's just like there's the the supply and demand of music is so out of whack. Like the supply is so massive and the demand is like really hasn't changed that much. It's just people love music. Um, there's just so much more to choose from, you know? Yeah. And so on the one hand, like, you know, it would have been nice for like when we were starting out to benefit from like that awesome technology. Like when we were making our recordings when we first started, 
Jim had like a cassette four track. That's what we use, mm-hmm. you know. Now kids can use GarageBand and Logic and, uh, you know, get All pretty this. cheap gear to record yeah. stuff in their room. And it's amazing. And like, yeah, so like there's some, like like we've been talking about this whole time, there's some really positive things about all of it, but then there's also some of these unintended consequences of, you know, like the MP3 is a great example. It's like, that's such a double-edged sword um, yeah. in, in, the, in the history of the music business that um, it's a great example of, yeah, it's cool. It's cool that you can walk around in your pocket with all the songs in the universe, but then it's also was a big transition that the music industry had to go through and is still trying to figure out. Yeah. Still trying to figure out it's weird with the MP3s, but back to MySpace, <laughs> I just remember that was the beginning of, of you always had to like pay attention to like, if you started a new band, cause everybody, you could just start a new band that doesn't exist. And everybody was doing that. Like, let's start a band just in case we do it later. And they would put make <laughs> make a MySpace page for it. And so there was this like impossible to find a cool name for a new band you were starting. And the same kind of, I mean, th- that persists as the internet is gone. You know, people aren't checking Google as much as they probably should. But like, that's a real thing now with probably any major artist. When you put out an album, when you put out a whatever anything that has a name to it that people are going to search what's that going to clash with so you're you're like yeah you're not going to put out craft cheese mac and cheese the the new album you know because that would yeah screw you up you know so you have to like kind of pay attention to that too so like sure w- with the invent of all these great tools we also have like more to think about other things to think about than just the music and just coming up with a good idea because back in the day it was just let's come up with a good idea because guaranteed nobody's going to have heard of this you know? Yeah. And I, I think like, you know, uh, back when, I mean, probably when you guys got your, uh, when, when you signed to your label, when we got signed to our label, like we were getting signed based on a, what we could be a potential, you mm-hmm. know, like, um, you know, and then our guy might find a band back in that day and like, be like, yeah, these kids are really talented. They just, you know, I think if I sign them, they can, you know, giving them some support, they can become something that they're not now. Yeah. And I feel like, the way it is now is labels are like, they're waiting for the band to be what they are going to be. And then they're, you know, so in a weird way. My dog's okay. Hey, shut up. <laughs> uh, and now okay. it's like, now these, these, um, these bands have to like build up their own following themselves with, and they, they're going to get signed on how many followers they have on TikTok or, or Instagram or Twitter or whatever. And it's like, in a weird way, that's like, that's like bands are kind of off on their own now to create their own following using these tools that are available to them. But, you know, it's like the, the gatekeeper is, is largely just like public opinion. And b- back in our day, it was like we had, you know, a r guys were kind of the gatekeeper as to who was going to be signed and supported and who wasn't going to be. Um, so it's like, like I said, it's, it's, it's like there's unintended consequences of all these cool benefits that we have with technology is that now as a band, you're not, you have to become experts at like marketing yourself, not just making music, not just, you know, being creative or playing live. It's, it's like, can like, it's almost like if you can market yourself and you can give yourself a chance. Yeah. And then there's the bands who don't like, dude, if that, if we had to prove back when we were like, you know, 17, 18 years old, that we were good, good at marketing our band. Like we wouldn't go anywhere because we're still not very good at it. And we're like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) we're like like in our forties. I was going to ask, I mean, marketing seems to be the hardest part about the music business for band, for artists, I think. Um, And it probably honestly is for all, all areas, you know, promoters, they have to market. Yeah. Record labels have to market. So everybody has to market. And, and, and it's constantly changing, just like the internet's constantly changing. How marketing works, whether it's algorithms, whether it's um, the company, the companies, you know, changing how they let you, you know, their their people see you or whatever. So it's like that's got to be the hardest thing. And so, how do you go yeah. about in 2022, 2023? Do you do you kind of continue to do what you've always done, but are you looking for new things, or are you do you 
forget everything in the past and just try something new. I, I don't know. Or do you, as a drummer, not really even think about that? <laughs> no, we think about it. I mean, it's hard for us because, you know, I think um, for better or for worse, our marketing strategy has always been just be ourselves. Um, sure. Present ourselves as we are and um, approach it kind of like a music fan. Like, what do we like? You know, as music fans, what do we see other bands doing that we think is cool? Um, and, uh, you know, there also is kind of like this marketing yourself also requires a sort of almost like conceitedness a little bit, you know, like and and that's um, not something we're super good at. Like a lot of the guys in our band are, you know, especially like I'm probably the most extroverted person in the band, you know, um, the and we just aren't we aren't like really out there pounding the pavement, like, yeah, figuring out what is that why they uh, sorry, is that why they make you do the let interviews? Me, let, me, let me put my dogs. Hey, come on. Okay. Come on. Come on. Come on. Are you in Arizona? Oh, here. Yeah, I'm in Phoenix. I'm in nice, nice. We were just Sorry. in Marquee okay. in April. Oh, fun. cool. It was great, yeah. Always a good um, time. So, cool. So what, was, so what was the question? So marketing. Sorry. So we were talking about marketing and, and, and how you're the most extroverted guy in the band, which is yeah. probably why you get stuck doing a lot of these interviews, and I appreciate it. But, <laughs> but uh, you know... Like I say, it seems to be the hardest thing to do. So when you're, I think the easiest thing marketing wise is what do we, what are we trying to do? Okay, we have a new song, and and so you you want to get the new song out there. So you, do you make a video? Does the video like do videos matter anymore? A lot of the time they don't, but at the same time they kind of do, like on a deeper level. Like maybe this is my opinion, I guess. Um, just having something for somebody to see visually with the song is nice. So I, I appreciate yeah. your, your uh, performance video you guys released for the for something loud. You know, it's oh, just, thanks, man. Yeah, it's just good to have that's something. something we believe. That's something we believe pretty firmly is that, it, you know, everything needs some kind of video component, even if it's pretty simple. Um, it needs some kind of video component, I think, just for the ability it just i think it makes it easier for people to share it um i think it makes it a little less hard to ignore you know i think um you know i think video naturally just kind of catches your eye fat, you know better than photos do you know just like this this uh, static photo shot or a cover image so yeah. i think we try to do something um that has the video component to it with everything we do. Um, it's just hard for us because it's like, that's not definitely our strength, right? Like we, we're not, we're not good at like making movies. You know, we can make, we know what to do when we're putting together a song and, you know, we have the kind of conventions we can follow and we've learned along the way, but um, it's hard because I also feel like it's, it's difficult to be a band and come up with good video concepts. Um, and we just had a lot of bad luck with that. Um, and in a way, it kind of has to come from you as the artist. Like, what's the idea? How do you want this song to look? Mm -hmm. And that idea, I think more than more often than not, should come from the, like, the artist and just find someone to help you execute that vision rather than like, OK, what's your video treatment for the lyrics and your interpretation of the meaning of the song? Like, you get all these crazy, wacky video treatments that are like, OK, this is not... <laughs> This is not us, you know? Right, so. yeah. And isn't it kind of like a sick feeling you get when you know somebody's done a bunch of work for you, but you don't like it? Or it, it, yeah. it's not that you don't like it. It's just like it's not what you wanted for this project. And you're just like, oh, now I got to say no to this person or tell them yeah. to redo it or do something different. It's like that's why marketing is hard as well because you got to do yeah. uncomfortable things to make your product or whatever it is, you know, your songs um, – sell you know to people yeah it's fucking we've, terrible we've, to think we've about we've made <laughs> on multiple occasions we've spent money making like expensive videos mm -hmm. that turned out to be terrible and we've just canned them 
Like we know, like we're not even going to put this out because it's not representative of who we are as a band, and and that sucks. Like that's a painful decision to make, mm-hmm. and it does suck because it's not like anyone's trying to make a shitty video. It's like everyone's trying their best that they can, but it's like that was I think sort of after a few times like that we realized okay the visual of the song and the idea behind it needs to come from us and it needs to be something that we think fits the song and we just have to find someone that can help us like execute it in a way that's um you know cool and and that that fits who we are and so i think you know for us like the video piece is 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 important and i think we're slowly getting better at it yeah takes a long time to figure it out <laughs> anything to figure anything out well yeah so you definitely have the audio down good luck with the video <laughs> <laughs> we're still doing the same things you know just trying to constantly you know videotape everything look at the footage go eh, it could be better you know like let's try something yeah. you know like that kind of stuff and, and we do that with music too i mean we're working on a cover song right now where we've just gone over and over different like arrangements for it like a million like how hard am i going to work on a song i didn't write apparently really hard because <laughs> yeah we can just doing it over and over but honestly that kind of keeps us motivated like if we if we're just doing things like if i'm doing a cover song and i just do what they do and it's like that's the arrangement done all right it works because that's how they did it that works but like it doesn't like keep me inspired as an artist and so if i'm gonna do something i want to make it worth doing now you know obviously depending on the song and all that it could that could change but but um it just i feel like whatever it is having a project for a band um new album a new single a tour coming up a live stream, whatever it is, if you're working towards something, much like the same way when people get tickets to a show, they have something to look forward to. It keeps a band motivated to like work together on things. And then Absolutely, I think marketing, like, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, and then marketing gets a lot easier from there. Cause then you're actually like having fun doing something. But. Absolutely. Like it's, it's the, you know, in a weird way, it's, it's easy as a band and, and we are probably guilty of doing this at times of like just micro focusing on like, OK, we just we need to write a song and record it and make that song as good as it can be. And I think um, what we're learning as we get older is is like, OK, so, yeah, that's important. But then what's the what's the grander idea of the song? Like like in a weird way, asking your song, how do we want this song to to not only what it, how do we want it to sound, but how do we want it to feel? How do we want it to look? You know, what is the, what, you know, in it, what is going to be sort of the theme of the art or whatever. And I think a lot of that is really good to think about mm-hmm. as you're making it or, or because sometimes, um, you know, it's, you want to, you want to feed into the same themes and you want to know that, the effort that you're putting forward is coming from a general place of, of inspiration or, or even just like thinking out loud, like, how do we want this to feel? How do we want, uh, the audience who's listening to the song to feel when they're listening to the song, what is it going to look like? And those kind of, that bleeds into what the art looks like, you know, it bleeds into, you know, could even bleed into like just themes of the song that you want to tap into. And I think asking yourself those, those bigger questions earlier in the process is really cool. It it gives you kind of like this, um, not only a focus, it not only helps you kind of root and focus your creative, uh, project, but it also, um, helps you make decisions within that process itself. Like, you know, every song and every recording has so many, you know, especially with technology, we have so many options, like, what kind of reverb do you want to put on the vocal? What kind of uh, delay do we want to put on the guitar? What kind of, mm-hmm. uh, what what guitar amp are we going to use? And there's all these millions of choices that you can make that you can get overwhelmed with. And it's, if you have like a, a sort of North Star for every project where it's like, yeah, the song needs to feel like this, it can help you make those little decisions along the way. I think it helps. I think that's huge, actually. Much, I mean, that's so big for, for artists to have a vision on what they want for themselves, you know, as a group, whatever it is. But 
but on down to the song. And that's something that I struggle with every single time. I mean, because I know it's coming. It's like, got to start thinking about this. And, and a lot of times, you're right, we'll put it off till the end. Like, we've already finished the song and then start thinking about artwork. We'll start thinking about video. And and it just makes it harder because you're like, you don't have that, that North Star. Like you're saying, you don't have those things already thought about, already siloed off. Like, here's our world for this project. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it is, you know, it's like making something is hard enough, like making a song or an album or a video, all of that stuff is, is really hard work. And it's like, you know, the more that you can kind of, as a band realize like we're responsible for like how this all looks and feels and sounds. So how do we want it to look? And then focusing everything on that um, rather than thinking, okay, well, the song's done now. We just need to find a video director that's going to give us a cool idea for the video. Um, you know, that's something we did forever. And it was, it's just like Russian roulette. You know, you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. Sounds like you guys have made a lot of changes over the years sort of to, to fix those issues. And, and that's, it's re- really what it takes is just years of playing together, years of having those experiences, working with other people, other teams. Do you have the same uh, kind of day-to-day team for the band, like with management or like uh, even even like media stuff? Like, do you have a camera person that comes along with you? Or do you have a new we person d- each time, kind of? You just hire somebody new. We d- we, we've never been super good about bringing like, people out with us or bringing like we'll have someone come to the studio for like a day when we're making an album and they can shoot we've done that um but we haven't had someone like embedded with us very much um if at all um very few occasions and you know we see the benefit of that like it's really you know it's a helpful it's a helpful thing um you know we're um Lost you. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, I think so. my my daughter called me. Um, oh. <laughs> all good. We'll wrap so up. I'll, we'll wrap I'll, up here soon. Here. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, cool. I think that um, the yeah, I think that's a really valuable thing. Um, you know, I think from us, it's just learning from learning from past mistakes. Uh, you know, every time you make an album, there's something you learn. Um, working with different producers is is great because you learn something new from from different people um as far as our management like we've had the same management company uh since 2000 around 2001 so that's been really um that's been a really awesome constant for us is having uh since then we've had the same management company the same business manager uh and then just recently, within the last several years, our our original uh, business manager retired. So we have a new one. And so we've had a lot of like uh, consistency with, with the team that we work with. And that's been a huge uh, plus for us because um, our management company is amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, everyone that we've worked with has, has really been great. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, bringing someone out on the road, for instance, like a social media person is, um, is a great thing to do. And, and that's something we're looking into kind of getting into moving forward. Cool. That's awesome. Well, speaking of like day to day stuff, uh, can we end with talking about how you warm up for shows? I always love that. And kind of like what you guys do before the shows to get ready. Yeah, as a we band geek, I, I love hearing that. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, man. so we we try to make sure we have some kind of like either big Bluetooth speaker or something where we listen to. We have like a playlist that we listen to before our shows, and we listen to it pretty loud. What's one or two um, of the songs on the playlist? Um, so one song that we really love is called uh, "Betterment" by a band called The Baptists. Um which is a freaking straight up banger. Okay. I'll check I'd it out. recommend it. if you have like some, some kind of run you're going on a workout you're going on or some sort of thing you want to get pumped up for that song will do the trick. Awesome. Um, and then we, 
uh there's a few there's um let's see here another song that we listen to a lot is one of the other ones this is a totally different song but it gets pumped up is a song called glad girls by uh guided by voices okay yeah cool cool so So, those are two mainstays yeah there's a song um coma girl by joe strummer that that's the song that plays right before we go on stage oh cool and and it's like show music as well but we actually will play it ourselves. So like, even though we have like our playlist that we play to the crowd or whatever, we have our own backstage as well. Like you're saying. So I, I yeah. love that. And coma girl is our, like it, anytime I hear it, not at a show, I immediately feel like, Oh, I got to get going, you know? So yeah, that's yeah. what you want. You want to do something that kind of flips, helps you flip the switch. And yeah. like for me as a drummer, I found jumping jacks are great. Um, just because it gets your shoulders activated, it gets your legs activated. Um, jump rope, if you have space for it, is a great, is an amazing drumming warm up. Um, I don't do a lot of like stick exercises before we play, um, but I, I mostly do like if I can do if I if I have a jump rope, cool. If I don't, I'll do jumping jacks, um, and I'll kind of try to stretch out uh, my hands. Um, and that's pretty much all I do. And drink a few beers for sure. All right, cool. And that works for you. You don't you don't get too tired. You don't get cramped up. No, I mean, out. I yeah, I mean, uh, shout out to a guy named Dave Elitz who plays drum. He's an amazing drummer. I know. Um, he's I also know a drum instructor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He 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 completely changed my setup. How I sit at the kit. How I hold my sticks. Um, a few years ago, um, when I was in LA, I, I, I met with him and, and that's completely changed my life. Like I don't hurt anymore when I'm playing, my hands don't get tired. Um, my legs don't get tired. Uh, what do you do? It's, it's you a, like, what did you have to do? Like, were you twisted? So too much yeah, like just really focusing on, it's a really simple concept. It's reminding yourself that the stick bounces. It's like very simple, like the stick bounces. When you hit the drum, the stick comes back and there's energy there. And just basically don't get in the way of that. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know. Uh, what, what about for like cymbals yeah, and, and, and stuff? And same, lot, same for cymbals? A, you, a lot of it. Is, yeah, where cymbals, I basically, I'm, I'm, I've trained myself over the several years. As I, I'm, as I get older, I hit my cymbals a lot less hard. Hmm. So, um I just don't hit my cymbals hard. Um, I try to hit my drums hard. Uh, and um, a posture is a big part of it, too. That's the, that's the main thing is, is, is improving posture at the kit has, like, increased my ability to be more efficient playing. So um, for the most part, it's, it's, um, it's been a combination of all those things. And it's not like, you know, we're not playing crazy, gnarly, you know, super fast drum parts it's pretty simple so it's like as long as i can just sort of make sure my body is staying uh balanced and in good posture it's my i usually don't need to do like crazy warm-ups before the show bravo to that (laughs) yeah you'll be good to go for quite a while i think with your style i hope i mean that's that's the goal like like you know in the end it's like it, it in a weird way uh Drums are kind of like the only instrument where, you know, um, there's not really like a barrier of body position or, you know, to, to play drums. You can just sit down at a drum set and start playing it and you can play it really well, even if you have really terrible posture. Most instruments have some sort of like, you know, you have to at least hold it like with a with a bass or a guitar, like you have to have a certain hand position in order to play and your body has to be in a certain position in order for you to achieve that. Or, you know, a wind instrument, like your omniture has to be a certain way. Or, you know, a violin, you have, you know, how you hold the instrument is almost just as important as, like, you know, the other things. Whereas drums, you don't have that barrier. So it's really easy as a young drummer to develop all these weird habits mm. and bad, like, bad posture. Um, and so it wasn't until way later in my career where, like, I'm getting up... I, from playing a show for an hour and a half and my back is killing me. My knees are killing me. And now it's like, I'm that started happening like 
15 years ago for me. And now I'm like in my mid forties and I feel better than I ever have when we're done with the show. So it's, it's pretty, pretty great. Yeah. That's amazing that you've figured out how to, how to play your instrument, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> finally. Yeah. 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 It's like, there's so much more to it than, or most more, more to most things than just playing something or doing this or that or whatever. But it's also like, how long can you do that? How many years can you sustain that? And that's when you find out, oh, there's there's a pain point here that I need to fix and that. Yeah. And, and I probably should do that with bass. I mean, bass guitar, like, yeah, I change sometimes the, the, the level at which I have my bass. And I guess that sort of like helps me a little bit here and there. But like, I, I always go back down, you know? It's like when, I'm, when I haven't played in a while, I was like, pull it up a little bit. Or when I'm with Goldfinger, yeah. it's like up a little bit. When I'm with MXPX, it's down a little bit. It's a little more just chaotic. And But but yeah, I had tennis elbow for talking, you know, just, you know, just stuff yeah. like that. But, but I feel like it's gone away over the years. Like this was years ago. Yeah. I kind of like had it. And I don't know what I did. I just, I stretched it more. Maybe that's it. And yeah, it's been all right. So. Just that, just that alone, like being aware of it and stretching it is, is key. I, I mean, just having like, I think for me as an older musician, like maintaining a kind of curiosity on how could I do this better has really helped me. I mean, I was sitting and watching a Tom, a Tom Brady documentary with my son. My son loves football mm -hmm. and he, Tom Brady was like working out with this guy at a high school um, you know, in Southern California, he was like this old man was like helping him co like coach him how to be a better quarterback. And this is like after he's won like six Super Bowls. And I'm like, he's the best quarterback in the world. And I was pointing this out to my son. He's the best quarterback in the world ever of all time. And he's still taking lessons. And my son looked up to me and said, Dad, do you ever take drum lessons? And I was like, no, you're right. I should take drum lessons. So <laughs> yeah. that's that motivated me to seek out Dave. And then when I met Dave, it totally changed my life. So it's like, you know, just having that curiosity of like, oh, I could be doing it better. Or even if it's like not even better, but like I could be able to maintain this and do it for longer. You know, like I think it's worth it's worth a shot. I think we all need to find our own Dave Ehrlich, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, dude, thank you so much for your time. I don't want to get too... We, uh, we're getting close to being at the end of your time. So thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to mention? Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. No, man, it was, a, it was great spending time with you. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, love your band. Can't wait to see what you guys do next and uh, come back on sometime again. Yeah, likewise, man. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Zach. Have a good one. Peace. Goodbye. Okay,